Robert Rowan was born in 1974 in Manhattan, but raised in Brooklyn, New York. He befriended Joseph Price. He and Robert belonged to the same secret society club called the 13 Club. The club's purpose was to engage in anonymous acts of kindness, and the people who were a part of this club really shared a special bond which continued even after college. In 2002, Robert met Catherine Ellen Yu. They had a bit of a whirlwind romance and were married the following year. As I mentioned, Robert had stayed close with the people he had met in college, who were all still living in the DC area. August 2nd, 2006 was a typical hot and steamy day in Washington, DC. Around 8.45 in the morning, Robert and Kathy were off to their separate places of work. He knew he had to work late that day, and he knew he wasn't going to want to commute all the way back home at the end of the day. Robert asked his friend Joe Price, who lived near DuPont Circle, if he could stay over. Joe had become a successful partner at a law firm. He was in a polyamorous relationship and lived with his two partners, Victor and Dylan, the same three people that had helped throw Robert's 30th birthday party a couple years prior. Besides Joe having a place for Robert to crash that night, Robert and Joe had plans to talk about a potential work project. From his call records, Robert called Joe at 1024 and just after got a cab from work to Joe's place on Swan Street, which arrived at the house at 1030. According to Joe, Dylan and Victor, Robert arrived, they greeted each other and had a quick drink around the kitchen sink as they caught up. Soon after turning off the lights, Joe woke up to the sound of chimes and a man grunting. Victor awoke to the sounds of someone screaming moments later. They jumped up out of bed and ran downstairs. They found Robert's door open and he was laying in bed. Blood on his chest and a knife nearby, Joe lifted up Robert's shirt and saw the stab wounds. Victor became hysterical. Joe asked Victor to call 911. Victor ran back upstairs to call 911. Dylan, who slept in a separate bedroom, was the last one to wake up. The police arrived shortly after Victor called 911, only five minutes later. The investigation quickly revealed that something was amiss. Nothing in the house showed any sign of an intruder. Nothing had been stolen, nothing was out of place, nothing looked messed up. The house was an older one with creaky steps, but none of the men in the house said they had heard anyone running down the steps before they found Robert. The knife near Robert's body was theirs. If someone was breaking into a house to harm you, wouldn't that person be prepared with their own weapon? Also, besides the initial 911 call where Victor was being hysterical, by the time the EMTs arrived, Joe, Victor, and Dylan all seemed to be rather calm. The EMTs walked up to Robert and saw three large stab wounds, but no blood. One of the EMTs later said Robert looked like he had been showered and then placed back into bed. When the homicide detectives had arrived at the house to start their investigation, they were taken back to see that three men in white robes appeared as if they had just showered. When Joe, Victor, and Dylan were taken into the station for questioning, all three of them continued to appear calm. They didn't appear to be behaving like people who had just witnessed a horrific crime, and they were definitely not acting as if their friend had just been killed in their own home. They stayed calm and composed. All three of them had similar stories, but compared to the story that Joe, Dylan, and Victor told police, the crime scene told a different story. The bed Robert was in still had a perfect crease of the folded bed cover. The back door might have been unlocked, but the door wasn't left open. Open. If someone was running out, it's hard to imagine they close it behind them. The gate to the backyard was dead bolted. Could an intruder jump over the gate? Yes, but when the detectives look above the gate with the flashlights, they saw undisturbed spider webs going from the top of the gate to the tree right above it. Detectives first thought that Robert going to Joe and his partner's home had to be for a different reason other than not wanting to go to his home late that night. They couldn't believe that a straight married man would choose to spend the night at the house of three men who were involved in a relationship. But Joe was adamant that Robert was a happily married man and his and Robert's relationship had always been purely friendship. What would Joe's motives be? He had been close friends with Robert for years. When questioning first began, Joe was presented with Dylan as the first suspect since he was in a room alone and couldn't precisely be accounted for. Joe was adamant though, that there was no way Dylan or Victor could do this. He said there's no chance either one of them could punch someone, let alone kill someone. But since Dylan's room was on the same floor as where Robert was staying, Dylan was taken from the homicide office to the FBI to take a polygraph test. During the polygraph test, he was asked two questions. Did you kill Robert? And also, do you know who killed Robert? Both answers came up as DI, deception indicated, meaning he failed. Joe, Victor, and Dylan decided they didn't want to answer any more questions without a lawyer present, and without any concrete evidence, the detectives were unable to make any arrests. That night, before going to the homicide office, Joe called Kathy to tell her that her husband being taken to the hospital. She didn't know until she got to the hospital the extent of Robert's injuries and that he was pronounced dead on arrival. When the news broke out about the murder in the neighborhood of Swan Street in the house of Joe Price, the community was sympathetic. Kathy, at first, believed that her husband 
had been involved in a random violent crime, and it wasn't until she sat down with the detectives that week and when she realized that they believed Robert's friends could have been the reasons why her husband was no longer alive. That same night after she had spoken with the detectives, Joe called Kathy to ask if she could tell him what the detectives had asked her and what she had told them. This was the first indication to Kathy that Joe, Victor, and Dylan were hiding something. Shortly after that initial call between Joe and Kathy, Joe, Victor, and Dylan went to Kathy's house to have a private conversation. They went to the basement of her house and whatever it was that they said to her, she believed the story they gave her. Detectives continued their investigation by knocking on the houses of neighbors to see if they had any information regarding what had happened on the night of August 2nd. The neighbor directly next door was an older couple that said that they were home watching a news program that night. During the program, they heard someone scream. The show was on between 11 and 11.30. This is the only scream they hear, and it matches with what Victor first told detectives. He screamed when he saw Robert's body, but Victor didn't call 911 until 11.49. Detectives believed it was somewhere between 19 and 49 minutes from Victor's scream that they waited before calling for an ambulance. The detectives were having a hard time believing the story the three men told. It just couldn't be real. The intruder would have had to go into the kitchen to grab the knife. They would then have to walk up 16 loud stairs. Instead of going into Dylan's room that was straight ahead from the top of the stairs, the intruder would have to turn 180 degrees from the top of the stairs and walk through a hallway to get to the room Robert was in. Due to where the wounds were and how the knife had entered, the intruder would have had to walk all the way around the bed to the other side of the room. Lastly, Robert had his wallet, an expensive watch, and his phone on a table at the end of the bed. And as I mentioned, nothing in the house was stolen. So 72 hours later, they were really looking for anything else. When the detectives went into Dylan's room, they found hundreds of devices and SM equipment. Anything could look suspicious, especially torture devices. Because of the discovery of these devices, detectives had a new direction to go in. They requested a kit on Robert Wong. The kit is used by a medical examiner to perform an examination of the lower region with a swab. The examiner detected which then meant that besides the stabbing, the case was potentially also SA. They have DNA evidence, but when the DNA results came back, it is determined that the specimens found were Robert's. But another thing that doesn't add up is that the autopsy didn't show any form of activity. However, the scene found was in places Robert couldn't get to on his own. Now, detectives believe that he was incapacitated, but there were no marks on Robert's arms or legs, so he wasn't tied down. The crime scene did look staged, no blood on Robert, hardly any for that matter. The bedding being turned over as if he hadn't gotten to it yet. The detectives brought canine cadaver dogs. These dogs are trained to alert when there's either decayed human blood, skin, or blood cells. The dogs picked up a scent in two locations. One was the dryer in the laundry room and the other was the rear stairwell drain outside. But there's still no concrete evidence. There's, there isn't enough of a DNA sample. The detectives collected 280 samples from all over the house. They had the house to search for three weeks and caused over a quarter of a million dollars in damage in their search for an answer. At the end of those three weeks, they had no blood samples and were nowhere closer to figuring the case out. Joe had told the detectives when he was first questioned that he had touched the knife to remove it from Robert. The results from the forensic lab don't show Joe's fingerprints. In fact, there's no fingerprints belonging to anyone in the house. Furthermore, the wounds on the Robert's chest do not match the size of the knife used. There were also white fibers on the knife. Those fibers were consistent with the towel Joe's used to try and stop the bleeding when he was on the phone with the 911 dispatcher. But he said he removed the knife as soon as he found Robert. So unless he wiped the knife off with his towel after, there shouldn't be any throw fibers. Is there a reason someone would wipe the knife of a murder weapon besides to cover something up? Once the detectives discovered the knife Found was not the weapon used, they went back on the possessions that they had found in Dylan's room. There was a three-piece cutlery set that he had kept in his room, a carving knife, a carving fork, and a smaller knife and the smaller knife was missing. The smaller knife's size and shape is more consistent with the wounds on Robert's chest. However, the detectives could never find the smaller knife. Where was it? Now they were met with another dead end. Three months after the crime took place, a burglary at the Swan Street house was reported. Curiously, the person to report the burglary was Joe's lawyer. Joe, Dylan, and Victor had moved out and were no longer living at the Swan Street house. Come to find out that the person who had robbed the house 
was actually Joe's brother, Michael Price. He reportedly took the flat screen TVs from the house to pawn them. The charges against Michael are dropped, but the road that this burglary takes the detectives down is a new and interesting theory. On the night Michael stole the TVs, he entered the house using a key. Makes sense that a family member would have a copy. That's not out of the ordinary. But when Joe was originally interviewed by the homicide detectives, he told them that it was possible that contractors had a copy of the house key. But otherwise, no one besides Joe, Dylan, and Victor had a copy. When the detectives look into Michael Price further, they find out that he's been in night school studying to be a phlebotomist, which is someone who draws blood. Michael has access to a hospital where it is very possible that he could easily get his hands on paralytics. Specifically, which is a medication used to cause short-term paralysis and used for general anesthesia. The drug cannot be detected easily as it metabolizes quickly into the natural components present in the human body. Michael had had perfect attendance except for one day. He was not at school on August 2nd, 2006. When detectives checked Michael's phone records, his phone did not appear to have been near Swan Street that night. He also had an alibi. His partner said they had been together. The detectives found themselves at another dead end. There was nothing connecting Michael to Robert's death and no evidence he was present for. It's crazy to think that all of these theories the detectives have come up with sound completely probable, but every avenue they've turned they aren't successful. How is there zero evidence? A year after Robert had been slain, the once newsworthy and high profile case seemed to lose steam. Kathy reaches out to Robert's former law partners at Covington and Burling for help. The new head of the company is Eric Holder, who had been the US attorney in DC, which is the top prosecutor, by the way. To have someone like Eric agree to help Kathy is a pretty big deal. He's about to become the attorney general of the United States. Eric and Kathy, hold a news conference. When Joe, Victor, and Dylan had come to the house that one day early on in the investigation and spoke with her privately, she believed that these friends of Robert's couldn't have been involved. But a year later, when the news conference rolled around, it was clear to everyone that she no longer felt that way. Joe, Victor, and Dylan had sold the house on Swan Street and moved to Florida. No one had heard from them for some time. The press conference did little to help in finding and convicting the person that had hurt Robert. However, in October of 2008, an obstruction of justice charge was filed. First against Dylan Ward. The hope was that when he was alone again with a charge against him, he would break and give the detectives the answer they had been looking for. That wasn't the case. Dylan stuck with the story he had first told them in 2006. He didn't know any more than that. Next up was Victor in November 2008, who also wouldn't change or add anything to the original story. Finally, Joe was charged. All three men were released pending trial, but they were now subject to electronic monitoring and curfews. On December 19, 2008, additional charges of conspiracy were filed against all three men. During the same hearing, the electronic monitoring and curfew restrictions for the three defendants were ended and prosecutors announced the possibility that charges related to tampering with the evidence could be filed in the future. The affidavit, which is the sworn statement given under oath, that was filed by the authorities supporting the arrest warrant for Dylan was released to the public in the hopes that the release of it would turn one of the housemates against the others. It also showed the prosecutors lack sufficient evidence to charge any of the housemates with the additional crimes without the cooperation of a witness. The report states, the evidence demonstrates that Robert Wone was restrained incapacitated, sexually assaulted, and murdered inside 1509 Swan Street. And there exists overwhelming evidence far in excess of probable cause. It also said that Dylan, Victor, and Joe obstructed justice by altering and orchestrating the crime scene, planting evidence, delaying the reporting of the murder to the authorities, and lying to the police about the true circumstances of the murder. Once the affidavit had been made public, any doubt that Kathy and Robert's close friends and family might have had about whether or not Joe, Victor, and Dylan were responsible for this was gone. Although there was still no hard evidence, the report showed that the absence of evidence was a product of a cover-up, and the only three people who could have done that were the three people in the house with Robert when he was killed. Joe, Dylan, and Victor hired the top criminal defense attorney in DC. Bernie Grimm, who was representing Joe, filed a motion asking the judge to remove the toys and devices and any mention of misconduct as evidence. That decision put a wrench in the prosecution's case. The next thing the defense attorneys did was file a motion to have the judge decide the case, meaning she would be the one sitting in and deciding instead of a jury. The prosecutors did not oppose this request and Judge Lynn Leibovitz was to decide. The prosecutors didn't have to prove a motive, they just had to prove that the three three men conspired to cover it up. The defense team worked at taking the prosecution's case apart. When the defense team went to the house on Swan Street, they found that it was possible to unlock the front door by putting your hand through the mail slot. They found that if an intruder had gone out the back door, almost anyone would be able to climb over the gate. And lastly, 
The neighbor next door to the house on the other side had gone to the police the day after the homicide and told them that she saw footprints in her backyard. The police did not check because they believed they already had who they were looking for in custody. They had an answer or a rebuttal for every question. The defense continued to poke holes in the prosecution's case. Dylan's mom then came to testify saying that she had mailed Dylan the cutlery set and kept the small knife for herself. On June 29th, Judge Lynn Leibovitz found each of the three men not guilty of charges of conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and tampering with evidence. She explained her ruling for almost an hour from the bench, stating that she personally believed that the men knew who killed Robert, but was not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed the offenses with which they were charged. One year later, Kathy filed a wrongful death civil suit against Joe, Victor, and Dylan. She asked them to come and testify. They did not cooperate and pled the fifth. Over 16 years after the death of Robert, there has been no new information, no answers, and no arrest. Thank you guys so much for watching Killer Bites, and we'll see you all next time.